There's a black mark. Okay. Uh, okay. Does that look okay? Uh, yeah. If you can uh, slide that black block a little further, but. Uh, Okay, you just close the chat. Then we'll go, if you close the chat, then you'll be able to. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So uh, uh, great for Alistair to be uh, joining us talking about uh, collaborations with Tony. So take it away, Alistair. Okay. Very good. Uh, does the screen look okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Does so it sound okay? Yes. Sound is okay? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to uh, participate uh, in person. I was originally intending to, um, but uh, unfortunately I, I wrecked my back. Um, so it was impossible. Uh, but I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, couldn't uh, take part, but only virtually. It's okay. So at least I'm I'm glad to take part uh, take part in the celebration for Tony. Um, the uh, the reason I wrecked my wrecked my back was uh, was. Uh, Oops. What is this little animal? <laughs> I'm cat Minu. Uh, and uh, he has a habit of crapping on the rug when he doesn't get his litter box clean. So uh, we uh, thought we'd better get some more kitty litter. And, and uh, when we were in Costco, I. Uh, lifted a 50 pound bo box of uh, kitty litter and <laughs> the result was a disaster. So there you go. So you can blame it on me too, I suppose, or at 77 uh, years old, I think uh, I'm a bit, uh, a bit too old for lifting 50 pound boxes. Anyway, let's continue. I thought I'd begin with, um, looking at my own neighborhood in the collaboration graph. And uh, as you can see, I've, lot, I've uh, collaborated with a lot of people over the years, um, 20. And, uh, but the person with whom I've collaborated most is Tony. As you can see, there's five collaborations here and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll talk about them. Uh, as part of the talk. Uh, it, this uh, graph here, or my neighborhood in the graph, uh, also shows that I have an Erdős number of four. Let me see, one, two, three. No, sorry, th three. <laughs> three is better. <laughs> Tony is, is lucky enough to have an Erdős number of uh, two, but uh, I managed to have an Erdős number of three th through Tony. Okay, so there's all my uh, collaborations with people and uh, I've had a lot of fun over the years. Uh, the most important, uh, I've had a lot of collaborations with uh, very talented logicians and mathematicians over the years, but the most important of these collaborations was undoubtedly with, with Tony. Um, I've, I've had more collaborations with Tony than anybody else. And uh, there are also very intense collaborations as we'll see. Um, so moving on, my first collaboration, I, I, forget, I even can't even remember exactly how I came to know Tony. I must've been attending one of the classes in computer science. Um, I must have got to know Tony at that point, and we got got going on a collaboration. I uh, I started out in philosophy, uh, 
and uh, was interested in uh, all kinds of weird stuff like uh, Hegel, <laughs> which doesn't sound very logical, but <laughs> that was, you know, where I started from all this kind of very misty, mystical stuff. But then I read Bertrand Russell and uh, the introduction to mathematical philosophy and uh, that uh, kind of turned my head around. So that's how I got into logic. But I started off in non-classical logic, not classical logic. And uh, so I spent, uh, oh, I don't know. I went to Pittsburgh where uh, Anderson and Belknap, Alan Anderson and uh, Neil Belknap Newell was my thesis advisor. Um, Alan Anderson and uh, Newell Belknap were working on relevance logic. So of course I ended up working on that. Although I always wanted to be a classical logician, not a non-classical logician. So, but you know, that's just history. So I worked, I worked in that area for, uh, I don't know, a decade or two. But I still felt uh, a kind of lack, namely, I, I always wanted to, um, I always wanted to collaborate with people, you know, and, and, and the Toronto philosophy department actually didn't have any other logician at the time. It has a few now, but, but at the time it didn't have any. So uh, it was kind of frustrating, you know, I was a bit cut off. And then I discovered this, um, that uh, the uh, computer scientists, particularly around Toronto, were working on uh, classical logic, particularly the complexity of uh, satisfiability problems. So I thought, haha, this is, this is a way to go. And uh, I made a move into computer science, even though I'd started off in this completely different place, namely <laughs> um, philosophy and philosophical logic and so on, non-classical logic. So anyway, it was, a great, it was a great move. So not only did Toronto have a great faculty in computer science, they also had wonderful graduate students. And here's two of the graduate students with whom I collaborated at the time. Tony, you all know, uh, Steve, you may, not all of you may know Steve Bellantoni. He's, he's moved on to, uh, finance, you work in financial sector, but uh, he was a really great collaborator too. Anyway, uh, so what did we do here? Uh, there was a big breakthrough around this uh, time when I was uh, sitting in computer science classes. Probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in computer science uh, around that time, uh, namely Mickey Aitai's proof that of uh, super polynomial lower bounds for the pigeonhole principle. And I spent ages studying this, uh, this paper and so did Tony and Steve. It's a very difficult paper. It's very challenging. Uh, what, what Mickey Aitai does, I mean, is it, the guy's a genius, but his papers are, <laughs> I have to say, very hard to read. <laughs> but um, anyway, the, the way the, the way the thing is proved is that you start from a a, uh, a non-standard model of number theory, and then you force over you do forcing over this non-standard model. So it's a hard proof to understand. So we had uh, we had two two things that we wanted to do. The two things that we wanted to do were to, first of all, try to get a standard proof of this uh, risk result. And secondly, try to prove, improve the uh, Mickey Aitai's proof to exponential. We succeeded in the, the first goal, but not in the second. So that, that was a we, we got a super polynomial bound using standard techniques, but didn't succeed in, uh, in uh, getting an exponential order bound. We thought, we thought we did have one at first, but then that turned out to be a bust. So partial, partial success, but not complete success. 
Um, so, the uh, Tony, Tony persisted, as you all know, and eventually managed to um, get the exponential bound that we were after um, with uh, Paul Beam and Russell and Payazzo and uh, uh, Jan Krajicek, Pablo Pudlak and Alan Woods did it independently. So this was a, a, an amazing achievement and uh, so great work. Uh, what I, what I think this is, um, I think this was probably the most intense collaboration of my career. Um, I was working on the uh, Bertrand Russell papers at the time, and I remember driving back and forth to uh, Hamilton to visit the Russell archives. And as I was driving back and forth, I would uh, think about the pigeonhole principle, which was uh, their big problem. But uh, anyway. That was, that was a very intense collaboration and very enjoyable. So let's see, the, uh, these are the sort of pictures we spent a lot of time drawing when we were talking, talking in uh, people's offices, drawing these uh, kind of pictures of um, bipartite graphs where you've got N plus one on one side and N on the other. And, uh, so this, this was sort of uh, how we thought about the problem. We, I remember spending ages looking at these uh, pictures. Uh, I, remember, <laughs> I remember Tony actually got fed up having to make it N plus one and N. She said, why don't we just make it N and N on one side and N on the other? <laughs> Simplifies the picture. <laughs> I think it's probably not a bad idea. Anyway, there's the, uh, there's the pigeonhole principle, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And uh, so you've got the negative clauses, positive clauses, and so on. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the lower bound, the standard lower bound, not the one you do using non-standard models is done using uh, decision trees. So it's the uh, decision tree model and you're, you're assigning formulas um, decision trees, and uh, then you want to use a random restriction to get uh, lower the depth. That's the basic idea. Uh, the, the reason we weren't able to get a, an exponential lower bound is that we were following Mickey Aitai at that point, and uh, he, he uses decision trees that are over a small set of nodes. Okay, and that, that, that won't give you an exponential lower bound. In fact, uh, the paper that I wrote with Steve and Tony explains why it doesn't work. Uh, the, the improved exponential lower bound comes from using not decision trees over small sets of nodes, but rather small depth decision trees, that's the key. Okay, so anyway, Tony and uh, Paul and Russell got this great result. And so all of this, uh, I think it illustrates one of Tony's outstanding qualities, namely persistence in pursuing a, a problem. After, after we'd failed to prove a, a exponential lower bound for the pigeonhole principle, I gave up and uh, Steve uh, moved on to other things, including, he, he actually was interested in uh, postmodern philosophy, which I, I didn't find that great interesting, but <laughs> Steve had quite a thing about, uh, Steve Valentani had a bit of a thing about postmodern philosophy. Anyway, that's, that's a different question. Anyway, Tony continued and eventually succeeded, and now it goes to show it, her uh, determination to succeed in solving a problem. So great work. All right, so that's the pigeonhole principle, uh, partial success. And uh, my uh, collaboration with Tony and Steve was, as I say, probably the most intense of my career. Here's the second collaboration. Uh, this was upper and lower bands for tree light cutting plane. <clears throat> 
Uh, I can't honestly say I <coughs> really contributed a lot to this. Um, Tony and Russell did the uh, did the really heavy work, heavy lifting here. Uh, the only thing I contributed was an upper band for uh, graphs with a no perfect matching. That's the only thing I contributed. So I'll I'll pass on to other collaborations where I think I did manage to contribute something. <coughs> Here's the Hayash calculus or Hayash construction from graph theory. So what is this construction? It's a way of, it's a kind of proof system uh, for generating non-K colorable graphs, okay? I think it was invented in the first place with the hope of uh, solving the four color problem at that time. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, it's never made any useful contribution in that area, but it's an interesting calculus. So here's the, here's the calculus. So think of it as a, a proof system for graphs. The axioms, this is for um, non uh, three color ability. Okay, so, so you're trying to generate all non three colorable graphs. So your axioms are K4, copies of K4. And the rule, the basic rule, the Hayash rule is this, you, um, you take two graphs. So here we've got two uh, K4s and we identify these two nodes here, these two vertices. And then having identified the two vertices, you eliminate these two edges and then we add a new edge along the top, okay? And you also have a rule that says you can add um, vertices and edges ad lib, okay? So it's, it's corresponds to the rule of weakening in propositional logic. So why were we interested in this? Well, first of all, I, I kind of like graphical stuff. I like pictures, but uh, another thing is, uh, that um, there was an interest in graph, the graph theorists were interested in this calculus because they wanted to know how complex the derivations had to be. Um, Bjarni Toft uh, had uh, suggested a, um, he suggested a, uh, a sequence of graphs that are not three colorable, but it's not obvious how to prove them using the Hayash calculus. So how did we, but in fact, it turns out they, they do have feasible proofs. And the way we proved that was, the way we proved it was by showing that the, uh, the Hayash calculus is in a certain sense equivalent to extended, uh, extended Frege system. Or extended resolution, same thing. Um, it, it turns so it turns out that the um, that the calculus is actually very powerful. It's a, it's a, a very powerful system, and uh, it also allows you to show very easily that certain sequences of, of graphs are actually quite easy to prove in the calculus because of the result of Steve Cook, it's a very old, but a very deep result that if there's a feasibly constructed proof that a sequence of graphs is, uh, sorry, if, if you have a sequence of pathologies rather, that for which there's a feasibly constructed proof that, the, that they're contradictory, then then there's short extended Frege proofs or feasibly feasible size Frege proofs, extended Frege proofs. Okay. Now, what we did was we, uh, we showed that uh, the uh, Hyos calculus is in a certain sense uh, equivalent to extended Frege. So what does this mean? It means that 
the uh, examples that were cooked up by uh, Bjarni Toft. In fact, since the proof that these are not three colorable is uh, feasibly constructive, it shows that there are short extended Frege proofs of the corresponding formulas, logical formulas, and hence that there's a short uh, Hayash calculus proof. Okay, so uh, that's the result. Uh, I think it was a nice result. I was quite pleased with it. Uh, fortunately, Tony was, uh, she was uh, still a graduate student at the time and she did all the real hard work. Uh, you know, the translating back and forth between graphs and uh, logic is, is actually quite kind of, common. you have to encode things in the right way. And fortunately, Tony was, I, I left, all the heavy lifting was really, <laughs> really done by Tony. Um, I think I contributed something, but uh, I have to say, I think this is a place where Tony did an awful lot of the work and I'm very grateful for that. So anyway, I think it's a nice result and quite pleasing. Okay, so that's the highest calculus. I think it was a nice paper that I did with Tony there. All right. Uh, fourth collaboration was with uh, Tony and Noriko Arai, and that was complexity of analytic tableau. The, uh, the complexity of analytic tableau is compared to, uh, you may not be too familiar with analytic tableau, but it's been it, people in, involved in automatic, automated theorem proving actually have used tableau quite a bit. And there's, there's a, uh, series of conferences on analytic, analytic tableau. Um, so it's, it's something that interests people. Anyway, uh, there's, an old, there's an old collection of examples uh, due to Steve Cook, I think. And uh, they're based on trees, okay? And uh, so, the way you look at it is this, you, here's, you, you label the internal nodes of the tree with uh, variables. And then if you go left, you have a, uh, a positive thing. So Q here, and if you go right, you have a not Q. And okay, so there's your set of disjunctions. And uh, these separate clausal tableau. Uh, clausal means that you, you explode the, uh, you explode the each disjunction, each clause is exploded completely. Now these separate clausal tableau from, from tree resolution. However, uh, it was pointed out by Fabio Masacci that if you formulate uh, tableau with binary decomposition, so you're, see, if you look at the, uh, at the uh, various literals here, you can see that once, if you're getting closer to the, the leaves, the, uh, the literals at the leaves are less and less significant. The one at the, at the root is quite significant, but then it gets less and less significant as you go towards the, the leaves. And the result is, um, if you, when you look at the, the place where you've exploded the one of these clauses, okay, so, so let's say this not P or not R is one of the clauses, not P, R, or not S. If you look at the subtree that has this, let's say S or not S, you have to keep basically repeating a whole mass of stuff. So yeah. that's why you can't simulate um, tree resolution efficiently. But Fabio Masacci pointed out that if you formulate Tableau with binary decomposition, where you give preference to the more significant nodes, then you can get an exponential speed up. And uh, so uh, with Tony and Nariko, we gave up, there's various ways of formulating analytic Tableau. One is the clausal way, the other is you can just do kind of arbitrary decompositions. You can just 
chop chop a a clause into bits arbitrarily, and we give a pretty complete analysis of the, the possibilities there. So that was my um, and actually um, you can uh, show that. Uh, you could, there's actually a quasi polynomial uh, simulation of tree resolution by this system. Okay, so that was uh, that was the uh, analytic tableau work that I did with Tony and Noriko. Fifth collaboration. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun too. Uh, I remember spending many happy hours in second cup with Tony and uh, Jan Johansson working on an exponential separation between regular and general resolution. Uh, my, my favorite clauses, uh, my favorite examples for uh, resolution were always the Satan clauses. That's, that's where I started my work in proof complexity actually was with the Satan clauses. And uh, uh, I, I recommend, by the way, a very nice survey paper by Tony and Noah Fleming on the Satan clauses. Very nicely written survey with all the stuff about Satan clauses. But if you look at uh, if you look at the Satan clauses, the graph-based clauses, the, it looks as if the best proofs are always regular, that is to say, they, they never query a, a variable more than once on a given thread in the proof tree. So it's like a read once branching program. So I was sort of convinced that regular resolution was, uh, was optimal, but of course it's completely false. <laughs> it's totally false. And, uh, but uh, anyway, we, we worked hard on that. And uh, we did eventually manage to get the uh, get an exponential lower bound um, separation between regular and general. So that was nice work, and I enjoyed working with Jan and Tony. Um, there's still an open problem there, which, as far as I know, is unsolved, namely um, to prove or disprove that regular refutations are minimal for the Satan clauses. I kind of think that's true, um, but I don't know how to prove it. But uh, it's a rather special question, but I, th I think it's kind of an interesting question or more generally, um, for what sets of clauses um, are regular refutations minimal? And I think it's true for the Satan clauses. If you could solve it for the Satan clauses, I think you'd have a general proof but uh, I work I work off and on on this problem, but uh, never succeeded in uh, cracking it. But uh, I recommend it if you're interested in kind of rather specialized problems in uh, in resolution. Well, let's see what's the time. Three forty. I think I'm. I started a little late, but I think probably uh, probably I should stop there. Um, I apologize for, I, I hope to make a better better talk, but I really was flat on my back for about two, two weeks. And if you notice, I'm kind of uh, channeling my inner Steve Bannon. So <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, uh, wish Tony a happy birthday. And uh, thanks so much for, uh, being my collaborator on lots of interesting projects. And it was great fun and uh, many happy returns, Tony. Thank you. Hi, Alistair, it's Tony. That was great. Thanks, Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, as a grad student, going and spending time with Alistair in his office or wherever was truly amazing. It <laughs> so many good problems. 
to work on, just handed them, them to me and then would spend forever. He'd go seamlessly between, you know, talking about philosophy, talking about classical logic, non-classical. Most of the time, at that time, I didn't know much of anything, but it was, he was patient and it was super fun. And yeah, it was also, yeah, super special time for me. So thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. So okay. all the time that we toiled um, with, you know, trying to turn Aitai's beautiful proof into a standard proof. Yeah. In retrospect, I feel like maybe that was a big mistake um, uh, because we can't, we, we don't know how to do that yet, you know, even with one level of mod gates. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Explain the problem again. Well, it's more of a question. So I'm saying Aitai had this brilliant idea of how to use non-standard model theory right. to kind right. of, because, you know, we were stuck from the get-go with just the fact that, you know, the, all the lines in a Frege proof are the constant ones. So like sem semantically, it's kind of, you have to do something really different right. than, than normal circuit methods. And I'm yeah. saying we spent all that time to make it standard, which I guess led to the improved exponential bound, but it took some focus away from, I think in my mind, like the, you know, the, the power of the thinking like I tie or <laughs> thinking in, in a non-standard model. And in particular, we don't know how to prove lower bounds at all for AC zero for with mod gates. So just wondering if you, what you think. Do you have any yeah, I, I haven't thought about these problems for, for ages. Um, Jan Krychek would be, probably be the best person to, you know, give you an idea there. Um, I agree, it's, it, we were puzzled at first, to, you know, how do you, how do you get a lower bound when everything is a tautology? <laughs> it's a bizarre question. Um, and I think the answer really is that uh, basically you're dealing with a non-classical logic. You, 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 the, the models that you have are in essence non-classical. Um, so, you know, you can have decision trees that falsify a tautology. I mean, this is what's happening in the uh, pigeonhole proof. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to it, but uh, I, I think it's kind of funny that when I was working with you and, and Steve on these problems, I realized that I kind of come full circle. I wasn't, it started off in non-classical logic, but in a certain sense to get lower bands for bound to depth Frege systems, or I guess for Frege systems generally, you have to have non-standard models. I mean, how else are you going to falsify a tautology, right? You have to have a model in which, um, you know, as long as the proof isn't too big, you can make the uh, axioms true and then falsify the thing you're trying to prove a lower band for. That's at least that's the way I think about it now. But I'm the, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question. Uh, Jan, Jan would be the right one, I think. Jan Krychek. Yeah, th and thanks. Thanks for the great talk, too. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so we're going to reconvene at 2.30 again with uh, a number of uh, Tony students who will be uh, speaking. Uh, we have many uh, great talks uh, this afternoon. So uh, best to get out while the weather is, is still good and, uh, and get some lunch. So. Oh, yes. And, and a reminder again. So after the, after the 5 p.m. talk, there will be a, a special event upstairs here at the Simons Institute. So not on this floor, but up one floor. The doors are normally locked, but we'll have them open so that everybody can come up. And so please don't go away. We have lot, lots more to do after, after 5 p.m. Uh, today. And for those on Zoom, we will have a, a, a Zoom, uh, virtual Zoom uh, uh, session for, for that as well. Thank you. Thanks again, Alistair. Thank you.